I'm hitting the record button. Is there a, is that sharp? Is that? Yeah, looking good. Okay. We got the Speedland GS Tam. I think if you add up the miles that we both ran in the shoe, it might be a conversational pace record. Without and a doubt. That's mostly thanks to you. Without a doubt. I think. Yeah, I put in... I thought it was going to be 210 miles and ended up putting 204 miles in on this shoe for this review. I came in just under the 100 mark, so I'm at like 95. So together we're just over 300 miles of GS TAM running. Uh, little disclaimer before we start, these shoes were provided to us by Speedland, but they will not be able to pre- preview or see any of this footage before it goes live to YouTube because we want to keep these reviews authentic for everyone. Um, Finn. You're actually in the same room as me. Which is special, and I hope that there's a way to do it more in the future. Yes, I think we're going to, yep, we're going to, every other shoe, you know, you fly to (laughs) Salt Lake, I'll fly to, or no, I'll fly to Salt Lake, you'll fly to Ashland. Once the CP single track budgets uh, increase, we'll be able to do it. Dude, that would be wild. Anyways, this has been a fun one, and definitely one of the, like, more requested, one of the more requested shoes, I would say, um... And we definitely wanted to make sure that we put it through its like honest paces before doing this review. So some quick stats about the Speedland GS TAM. In my men's size 9.5, I did go down a half size, more on that later. But in my size 9.5, the weight came out to 12.3 ounces, and that was with the Carbotex plate in the shoe. Without the plate, the shoe is 11.8 ounces, so the plate weighs half an ounce. I didn't really notice a difference at all when I was running in terms of that weight. Stack height for the shoe is 30 millimeters in the forefoot, 37 millimeters in the heel, makes for a seven millimeter drop. And the price of the shoe is $275, and that's without the plate. The Carbotex plate is a $35 extra purchase, which would make the total for the shoe and the plate $310. One thing about the plate, though, is that you don't have to replace the plate with every pair of shoes. So once you get the plate, it's going to last for a very long time because it would last across multiple pairs of shoes. Just, uh, again, how many miles did you get in this shoe? 204 miles. All right, and I was just under 100. And... One of the, we actually got to uh, share a lot of those miles together. I think we did eighty one of I did eighty one of these miles with you here in Flagstaff, Arizona during the Cocoa Donut two hundred and fifty week. Yeah, so we actually got some mutual testing in Flagstaff, Arizona. I got to take him through the usual paces in Ashland, Oregon, and then you also got to do some runs in Salt Lake City. Did a fair bit actually on the road. I would say maybe twenty or thirty miles on the roads of Salt Lake City, and then. Uh, don't typically do public math here, but roughly 80 to 100 as well on Salt Lake City trails. So what did you think of the fit? The fit is probably one of the larger questions for the shoe. Um, this is actually my second pair of Speedlands. I had the original SLPDX and uh, definitely very different shoes, uh, those two models. But how did you feel about about the fit, the width, the length of the shoe? Width, length, fit, all eerily similar, I would say, to the Brooks Caldera shoe that we reviewed uh, earlier this year. I think um, maybe we can talk about price point later in the episode, but it felt like Brooks was, the Brooks Caldera is like a less sexy, boa-less version of this shoe, um, extremely wide up in the forefoot. I do love this boa dial system. I'm not somebody that enjoys tying my shoes. I'm not someone that's great at tying my shoes. This takes care of it for me. Uh, great lockdown. So uh, similar. And I think when we get into also like what I would use this shoe for, similar along the lines of the Brooks Caldera. Yeah, this is definitely like your max cushion, like high stack shoe, but it's not particularly mushy. And that was like something that I found very interesting. But we'll dive into the feel in a little bit. Um, I think if anything, the shoe, for me at least, the way it felt, it felt like it ran slightly long. Because off the recommendation from Speedland, um, I went down to a size nine and a half, but I feel like I wouldn't say everyone needs to go down a half size. This is one of those shoes where like, I definitely could have done a 10 and this nine and a half fits a little bit smaller than true tens. So like if anything, you know, it, it probably runs a quarter size long, you know, like this probably fits more like a 
nine and three quarters if that was if that was a shoe size so a lit uh, probably a little bit long um so i would you know adjust the sizing accordingly yeah and i ordered a size 12 uh true to size and uh didn't have many issues it felt it felt like a good fit yeah finn having a little bit of higher volume foot getting that true to size is going to be nice uh, me having a little bit narrower foot a little lower volume i'm glad i went down that half size um so take that with a grain of salt um bow dials so this upper is actually like from a structure standpoint it's relatively unchanged from the previous uh sl pdx and uh sl hsv models but the materials are a little bit different yep. um i don't think the departure from dyneema sacrificed the durability of the upper at all because i you've agree definitely put it through the paces and the upper seems totally fine Upper is very much intact. We can talk about the outsole in a second, which is a different story, but uh, upper very much intact. And you've even got some like scuff marks on the boa dials because I remember you fell on a run right behind me, yep. smashed the bow dial on a rock and it seems fine. And I thought for a second it was going to break and it held firm. Yeah. And I guess to dive a little bit deeper into the bow dials. So this is the LI2 boa dial, which this is actually a, a unique boa dial to running shoes. Um, it, it it can tighten and loosen. Normally, boa dials can only tighten and they can't loosen. You have to pop them to loosen. Yeah, so this one you could actually tighten a handful of uh, clicks. And then when you're going uphill, you could actually loosen it a little bit. Or over the course of a really long run, um, you have that you know on-the-fly adjustability, which is actually pretty nice. I thought the lockdown was phenomenal. Yes. Um, there was no downhill that you know was too steep for this upper i feel like my foot was totally glued in um yeah i guess one thing that we should talk about is the the midsole insole i don't know i don't even know what to call it i mean there's there's a lot of pieces going on in the shoe and for a few reasons um so we have the outer midsole that can be seen that's made of this one's the full p the yeah the let me let me pull up my notes here like this one the the midsole that we can see is a beaded p backs and it gives the shoe a lot of stiffness and structure. It was quite a bit firmer than I, I guess, firmer than I expected to be because the only other shoes that I've worn that were beaded p backs were like road super shoes. <laughs> this, uh, so I just thought it would be that soft and I was very curious. It was firm and at first that bummed me out. Then when I took it on the trails, it made a lot of sense. Um, okay. I think if it was softer and more responsive, it would be too bouncy on the trails and it would be quite a bit less stable. So because it's firmer, doesn't quite rebound energy in such an explosive way, it, it, it felt much more stable on the trails than I initially thought it was going to be. And you're feeling more cushion underfoot because I, I didn't get a chance to wear the PDX, but would you say that you feel more cushion generally underfoot with the uh, GS Tam? Yes, this is absolutely Speedland's most cushioned shoe to date. And that's because, here, I'll take it out right here. So what Brett is pulling out here is the uh, drop-in midsole. Infomercial which, magic. Which is the same, if I understand correctly, as the one in the PDX, which is great because if you have a your carbon plate left over from the PDX, it works in the GS TAM. Yeah, so... The, the drop-in insole is one of the most unique parts of this shoe. It's a blended p material, so it's a little bit different than the midsole that you can see. I feel like it's softer, but in the last two Speedlands versions, this was all the cushioning you got because everything else around your foot was just rubber. So now we have two layers of midsole foam, essentially. And the reason why they did that is so that way you could remove the optional Carbotex plate if... Uh, if you already have one or if you had already purchased it. Finn, what did you think about this plate? Because we both went for runs with and without it. I want to hear your thoughts on if you think it's necessary, if you liked it. Yeah, I did about 140 miles in the plate, sorry, without the plate, and then 80 miles with the plate, all 80 miles with the plate here in Flagstaff, Arizona on Flagstaff Trails. And honestly, I'm still at a loss for what benefit the plate is providing to me when using the shoe. I did not notice there was no discernible difference in my opinion with the plate in. Yeah, that's interesting because I felt like 
I needed the plate because my foot wasn't quite wide enough to get all the way across the um, like this insole. And when my foot would hit the ground, it almost felt like without the plate, there was like a little one millimeter gap where the plate gets recessed. I felt like it was dipping inward a little bit and it felt a little bit less stable, but I could totally see where if your foot's a little bit wider and you kind of overshoot the whole width of the plate, it might become a non-issue. So it's stabilizing the midsole insert essentially? That's what it's, yeah, it's supposed to stay, like stiffen up the shoe and definitely, I mean, it creates a little bit of protection. I do feel like the, the midsole foam itself is so thick that you don't even need any additional protection from the rock plate. Yep. Um, the one thing I do struggle with a little bit is I just don't really feel like the plate does anything more then give me some additional rock protection. Like I wouldn't say I felt particularly like four percent better, four percent faster. I, no, and I think that's because this foam isn't that soft. If the foam was really, really soft, then the shoe would lean on this plate more to uh, keep it together. But um, it didn't. Yeah, it didn't change the ride dynamics other than just filling up that gap for me. So. It's a thirty-five dollar add-on. I do actually appreciate that Speedland didn't just mandatory make yes. you get that shoe, yes. get the plate. But um, I'm still not sure if in this one, the uh, GS Tam, it's fully necessary. Um, the plate felt much more necessary in their previous two models that were much lower to the ground. Yep. Yep. So in terms of the ride, you clearly put a lot of miles in it. And that's got to be for some reason. Did you like the ride of the shoe? Loved the ride of the shoe. I think when you are looking at your quiver of shoes, if it's in your garage, if it's in your house somewhere, if it's in your car, um, this is the shoe you pick when you want to have a very predictably comfortable ride. So maybe you're not out there trying to do long interval uh, pill workouts or VO2 max repeats, but if you want to go on a long run, or even if, and we'll talk about in a second where I'd use this shoe, um, if you're looking to do like these really, really long efforts out in the mountains, this is the shoe that I am pulling. I love it. it I, and, I, and honestly, I said the same thing about the Brooks Caldera. It's, it's all a part of that like max cushion line of trail shoes. Um, and I, I think Speedland fits neatly into that. Um, and, and same thing with the Boa Dials too. Just It's all across the board, just a convenient ride for a trail runner. Did you find the shoe to be a worthy door to trail shoe as well? Absolutely. And, and not even door to trail, but like door to Jeep road, like you and I did a run with a, a couple uh, road and track athletes this past when, Wednesday in flag and did like a 10 mile out and back on one of Flagstaff's Jeep roads. And I actually broke into a bit of a marathon paced workout in the back half with this shoe. And um, it felt great moving across that terrain faster than I expected. So yeah, dude, you were, you were hanging with the fast kids in the speed lands. That was pretty, pretty impressive. Um, yeah, I, I definitely like the ride of the shoe. So, I mean, I'm going to be honest, my initial impressions, like when we got this, the box and we opened it up and I put the shoe on, it was so firm and kind of stiff that I thought I was going to hate it because I didn't think it was that comfortable just walking around brand new. And it really has, it took like 50 miles worth of running for it to loosen up just a little bit. Um, I will say that very first run I did was much more pleasant than the very first walk I did in this shoe. And I think that partially is just due to, you know, the firmer, bouncier ride. Once I got in that running mode, uh, it it was just, it was the right amount of cushion. You know, I always talk about how I like shoes in that Goldilocks zone of cushion where they're not too mushy, not too firm, but kind of right in the middle. But I do like a lot of that foam. This uh, GS Tam, falls squarely into that Goldilocks zone for me. It's interesting, and I feel like you and I flip-flop depending on the shoe, but for me, this shoe out of the box was ready for a long run. Yeah, see, the first run out of the box, I wouldn't have trusted it for a long run because I just couldn't get the bow dials quite figured out. Like, I know exactly how tight to pull laces, but I don't know how many clicks, you know, the shoe needs to go before it feels tight. So that took a few runs. Um, and then and then I felt like I just needed a few runs for this uh thicker insole to kind of take shape and mold to my foot i will say that after 100 miles there's actually almost 
zero imprint of my foot on this thing. Which Likewise on mine. That speaks on behalf of the durability. And I feel like the durability is definitely something that's a big topic about the shoe because it's very expensive. And the whole idea behind this shoe was more or less like the shoe lasts twice as long. Therefore, and you pay twice as much. But so therefore, it's the same value. Let's talk about the durability a little bit because you've you've put 200 miles in the shoe. Yeah, and Brett, this is actually something you pointed out, and the 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 um, the upper of this shoe incredibly durable for me. The midsole of this shoe incredibly durable for me. I think it will last as it's built. It, this could be a 600, 700 mile shoe from that standpoint. But looking at the outsole of this shoe, and it is unique to my biomechanics, but getting a lot of last on the uh, back end, the heel of this shoe. I mean, we're at a point where um, on most shoes, and I'm sure you'd agree, like I would be shelving this shoe for good anywhere from 20 to 30 miles away just because uh, because of my biomechanics. And I don't know if you want to go in depth on that more, but I thought you that was fascinating that you pointed that out. Yeah, I mean, even if you, like if, even if you scuff your feet a little bit, like I just feel like the lugs shouldn't wear down nearly that fast i mean um i'll make sure that like the images that that people see are uh you know a little bit higher uh you know a little bit like we'll get some we'll get some b-roll yeah we'll get some good outsole but yeah um, maybe we'll do a little bit of comparisons to mine i'll make sure like you know and can see which one's like finn's 200 mile versus my 100 mile yeah but yeah even and i i have a pretty efficient foot strike but i'm even definitely seeing a little bit of uh outsole wear as well right around the 100 mile mark and i worry that some of these lugs would be worn down completely flat by you know 300 350 miles whereas the midsole and the upper would be totally fine you know it seems like we don't talk too often that the outsole is the part of the shoe that wears out first. It's usually almost always the midsole foam. Yeah, and I do understand from from what I heard uh, Kevin and Dave at Speedland say, they did reduce the lug depth on this shoe because it was not meant to be as technical terrain a shoe as the PDX was, but but still I have like no lugs left on the heel of the shoe right now, and I'm yeah, 200 and, miles in. Well, and decreasing the lug depth, but making the lugs wider and increasing the surface area that's touching the ground should theoretically make the shoe more durable because you have more material touching the ground and well for you that's definitely not the case um and i think part of that probably comes down to this rubber being very sticky very grippy yep and soft sticky grippy rubber the biggest uh kind of caveat to that is you make a sacrifice in durability so that's a tough one that's a tough one to grapple with for a shoe that's supposed to be you know, mega durable. Yeah. I mean, there will, that, that is the one part of the shoe that I, I know for a fact for me at least will, will break well before the 700 mile marker. Yeah. And so I guess the price, the shoe retails for $275. It is $100 cheaper than the last two Speedland models. So it is their cheapest shoe to date. 275 is still a lot. Let's talk about the value a little bit. So where do you see points of value for this shoe being $275? Yeah, I think that you can you can tell that there was just a lot of uh, craftsmanship put into this shoe. I think that when you think about Speedland and you think about what Kevin and Dave are doing, they care deeply about each line of shoes that they, they put out there on the market and, and they've been in the industry for a while and they're at this point as a business where they're they're small enough and they're maybe not as worried about economies of scale that they can put a lot of TLC into each shoe. And I think for people out there that are <clears throat> super fans of the sport and want to spend the majority of their free money in the sport and they want to support another brand like Free Trail that's partnered with them, I can see how they would be price insensitive. And two seventy five is um, it, it, there's not as much sticker shock as you might have. For someone that's a, like walking into an REI and is like, I want to get a pair of trail shoes. I want to get into the trail running. Oh my gosh, two seventy five. No, 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 no. I want this hundred and thirty dollar Nike Wild Horse. I think um, they're very clearly marketing to passionate super fans of the sport that want to support smaller brands on the up and up, and uh, they are unabashed about that, which I respect. Yeah, I definitely think you know one of the biggest selling factors for this shoe is that. 
you yeah you're supporting a small niche shoe brand that makes one product and they make it really well we see that in cycling all the time and i've always figured it was a matter of time before we saw that in uh in running and it is i would say it's like it's a hyper premium product yeah. I've, I've decided to coin a new term um there's the super shoe but then there's the hyper shoe and this kind of parallels with cars there's super cars which are very fast and very expensive there's hyper cars which are very fast very expensive and very luxurious yep i see this speedland gs10 falling into that hyper shoe category where you do get all the bells and whistles all the bits of tech yeah and, and you know i mean when you think about it our trail running is an expensive sport ultra trail running is a very expensive sport there we just commentated the cocodona 250 this past weekend where registration alone is 1400 bucks to start to start and you just have to believe that there is a market of people out there who only want the best products um to make sure that they complete these types of crazy physical challenges and so um yeah there is there's no question that there is a premium market out there for speedland to exploit and uh yeah there's they're not talking necessarily to either beginner trail runners or uh people that um are price sensitive about products yeah and i will say that like aside from you know maybe not getting the most durability in terms of miles out of it it's a reliable shoe, shoe that I found Very I could much. trust. A shoe that we did see on the feet of many runners of the Cocodona 250. They trusted this shoe for a 250-mile race. There was a Speedland athlete, Don Reichel, in the Cocodona yeah. 250. But there was also not Speedland athletes yeah. wearing Speedland shoes, and I think that says even more. Um, I guess that brings up the question, would you race in it? I absolutely would. If I had a new pair or if I had fixed my biomechanics before the – the tread on the back heel had uh, become an issue. I have two races coming up. I have the Tushers 70K in um, late July, and I have the Run Rabbit Run 100 in uh, mid-September. I would love especially to use this shoe in a Run Rabbit Run setting. Maybe you can find like a shoe cobbler in Salt Lake, and they can resole this shoe <laughs> for you. That would be amazing. And I know, you know, if we talk about like what the shoe is made for, I know I heard Dave and Kevin say that the vast majority, I think all of their athletes are trail athletes and a lot of them are ultra runners and they were looking for that max cushion or higher cushion shoe that could uh, comfortably get them through these 100K, 100 mile plus distances. And I think this is a great 100 mile shoe. I, I totally agree. I mean, I think, you know, this thing like it, it's built to go for very long distances at like one time. Um, I feel like if, if this shoe doesn't give you any like blisters or anything like that, it's durable enough where you might actually be able to cover, you know, 250 consecutive miles without having to swap out your shoes, which we debated by the way, this and week, I, what I don't, could do that. I don't think there's many shoes on the market that can do that, but I do think this GS Tam is one of the ones that you might be able to do that with. It's a Cocodona shoe. I think this might did Speedland just create the first ever 200 mile specific shoe? <laughs> That's the title of this episode. Oh my gosh. That is it. Um, but yeah, we want to know, have you run in this shoe? What did you think of it? Have you run in the previous shoe? What did you think of uh, comparisons? Have you run in any other of the hyper shoes out there? I feel like as of right now, you know, hyper shoes, the other hyper shoe out there is probably the Norda. Zero zero one model, Norda. Maybe yep. the Hoka Tecton X two. That one's bubble. How about bubble normal? Shoe. What's, what's normal's price point? One eighty. One ninety. Okay. I mean, that's. I don't think that falls in the hyper shoe category. Okay. But um, yeah, we want to know. We want to know what you think of this one, Brett. Just for context for the audience, like I had mentioned, the Brooks Caldera as a similar counterpart. Where else, like in terms of classifying the shoe and like its its cousins, its sisters, its brothers in the shoe mm -hmm. world, what are some other comparable shoes that you would uh, place it next to? So, I thought it it's felt similar. So it reminded me of both the Hoka Speed Goat and the Hoka Mafate, but firmer. It's like it's not as soft as those. It's firmer. The other shoe that I got actually interesting, similar vibes to was the Nike Pegasus Trail because it's like a firm-ish shoe okay. with a not very deep lugged outsole. 
Um, the only difference is that this shoe performed better on steeper trail okay. than the Pegasus Trail. But the Pegasus Trail was kind of like you described, like you lace it on, you go for a run, it works, the end. You know, I feel like that's that's how this shoe uh, performed. And for that reason, I, would, I wouldn't have any hesitation uh, throwing this on for a long race because I know it's going to work. And I know it's going to do its job. I know nothing's going to break. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I could, I could totally see myself racing. You know, probably, I'm probably only doing hundred milers in this shoe, hundred miles plus. One last thing, else I forgot to say about the, just the design of the shoe earlier. This is one of my favorite heel cup configurations on any shoe of all time. It's the perfect amount of material padding in the back. It's sort of like a thin layer. Um, I know we've had some shoes made by Brooks and just other brands that have a more beefier heel cup or even a higher heel cup. I think this is the perfect heel cup configuration. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this one too. You know, the top of the Achilles, it's, uh, it's very soft and there's minimal padding around the side, you know, behind the heel and around the ankle, but it's enough. Yeah. Brett, can I ask you one more question? Yeah, let's do um, it before we head out of Just in terms of like your wish list for updates to a hypothetical GS TAM 2, like what is at the top of your list for, if, if Speedland was to make an updated version of this shoe, like what would be top of the list for you? Okay, so I would love if the midsole was just a little bit softer for one, and two, just the rubber on the heel. So like just the back half of the shoe, be a much harder rubber mm. for durability. The rubber in the forefoot can be fine. It can stay soft. Um, you know, that's going to wear down uh, slower. The rubber in the heel, if it was a much harder rubber, I think it wouldn't sacrifice the ride or the feel of the shoe. And I think it could increase the durability quite a bit. So those are really the only two things that I would change if, uh, if it was in my control. Awesome. But yeah, if you thought this review was fun, please subscribe. Uh, like this video. Let us know in the comments what you think. We'll see you on the next one. I love this shoe.